If you like guns, this is the place to be. Welcome to Holtz Auctioneers, home of fine guns. It's got to be one of the rarest guns I've ever seen. Home to the weird and wonderful. This elephant gun is insane. As well as being home to the sealed bid sale with its 5,000 potential bargains. That is an interesting beast. Today we're at the Holtz July 2023 sale. I cannot wait to get inside and check it out. So first impressions is that this is a very full sale. Again, they vary in terms of how many guns they get in. It is about what they can find and what their very talented staff can go and hunt down. There's a lot of cased guns, a lot of very classy side-by-sides, and there is definitely more over and unders here than usual. There's also a few more Continental guns, and certainly a few of them have caught my eye. I think this is absolutely stunning. We're gonna have a look at that in a sec. But before we do that, let's check out the best gun in the sale. Simon, the reason we're starting together is because I think this is probably our joint favourite gun of the sale. Yeah, we have similar tastes sometimes, um, not always, interestingly. Yeah, which is but, good. But we have come together over this gun. This is a 32-inch Damascus barreled bar in wood Purdy hammer gun from 1877 and it is stunning it's beautiful cased with original accessories and the handling on this is highly unusual and quite breathtaking because you expect a 32 inch barrel gun to be like modern 32 inch barrel more guns. front heavy but this is the this is the beautiful art of gun making is all of the weight in this gun and these barrels is evenly distributed over the whole gun so you get a wand and it's beautiful so there's a big list of kind of cool stuff about this gun firstly it's a 32 inch 20 ball. yeah that's rare. That's rare. And secondly, it's a bar and wood hammer gun. Yeah. And made by Purdy. Yeah. Like you, you'd expect it maybe for some weird fringe maker, but one of the best gun makers that has ever existed to make something this. And it's curious. lovely. Yeah, absolutely lovely. And in its original case, um, it has been taken out to two and three quarter inch chambers, so it's 70 mil. That's a good thing. Yeah, this is a good thing for modern cartridges. And these barrels will take it. I mean, it's not, it's, you know, it's not the thickest barrels in the world, but you know, it's been around a while and it's, but the, when it comes to wall thickness, it's about who made the gun. It's not about, okay. if you've got badly made barrels, you know, they're, they're you liable to be damaged. Yeah. yeah. So, but if you've got really well-made barrels, that's why they made them lightweight, because they were really well-made. They trusted their, the guys who were making their barrels, so they could make them handle like this. It's a quality over quantity Absolutely. thing. Absolutely, yeah. It is unlike anything I've ever seen here. And we've, we've done a we've few guns on, on yeah, the we've TGS seen some and stuff. off. It, it's, I don't think, they do exist. There's, they're, they're so rare though, they're so rare. This is a spectacular gun. How much yeah, is it in for? It's an uh, estimate eight to 12,000 pounds. I mean, that is, Wait, for something quite reasonable. It is quite reasonable, actually. It's really hard to sort of say that because I don't have a spare eight to 12,000 yeah. pounds. But looking at some of the other guns in this room, and you could buy a very nice London Psylock for eight to 12,000, yeah. but this has got that curiosity factor, and that's kind of special. Lord Walsingham had 32 inch barreled hammer guns made for him. He then cut them down to 30 because he couldn't get on with them. And that was in a 12? No, uh, I think that was in a, was that 12 or 20? It might, it probably was 12 to be honest. He was a fan of 16 as well. So um, I'm not quite sure, but I do know that he had 32s that he then cut down to 30 because he just couldn't use them. But then they're an acquired taste. His shooting style has changed a lot. And they time, have changed a discussed. lot, yeah. Who would have bought this gun? What is it for? I mean, it's a live pigeon gun in spec, pretty much. This was a special order f by a, an officer uh, and a gentleman. Who, that's it. This is what he wanted. Colonel Gordon Campbell walked in and said, this is exactly what I want. Please make it for me. Just send me the bill. That's pretty... <laughs> Out of all of the, the badass flexes in the world, that could be one of the biggest. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those exercises that we, that we sometimes go through on long drives around the country trying to find interesting things to film and pick up for auction. And I'm sure you do it as well as money no object. How, what would you order? Walk in and order what you want. But I mean, it's something you can do in the comments as well, is you can describe your dream gun, get it off your chest. You've been thinking about it for the last 20 years, now write it down in the comments. Yeah, that is an interest. Because <laughs> this guy did it, he walked in and ordered it. There you go, that's an interesting one. Money No Object Dream yeah. Gun. Chuck it in the comments, and the best one, Simon gets to pick, can I have a free Holtz goodie bag? I'm, I'm I think we should pick together, so it's not just me, because otherwise, you know, it's gonna be invidious just to pick one out. We're gonna have to have a, well, well I'll tell you what, we will, Examine the comments in the gun room and we will take a consensus of opinion of what we think is the most interesting dream gun. Because those guys, the, the pool of knowledge there 
I really it will be an interesting insight into what they think. If See if anyone coincides with one of the comments. And that way they won't just hate me when I pick it. <laughs> In an ideal world, you'd take about a day of just having a look around here and actually making a plan for these films, but we don't really do that. We kind of just look on the website, look on the app, have a look, decide what we want, and then come here and realise we've missed quite a lot of stuff. And this, Lot 1703, is one of those. This is a Joseph Harkham Boxlock non-ejector trigun. A trigun is a gun that is used for fitting. So, as you can see, everything on this gun adjusts, which is kind of exciting. So you can raise up your comb height, you can move the entire stock up and down. You can change the pitch through these little dials at the back. So if we wind that in, the stock goes out, he says. Just a little jam there. You need a tool to adjust the cast and the, the height, but I've always thought these are fascinating things. For those of you who are more interested in practical guns, guns that go bang and break clays, or back guns that go bang and kill birds, but you're not really worried about the form, the history, any of that kind of thing, I have a Kriegoff Trap 80. This is a 1979 built gun, so it's right from the beginning of what would become the K80 that we know and love today. I can't say that I'm in love with the way it looks. It just says Trap 80 on the side. It's got a Monte Carlo stock, the classic Kriegoff grip, a slightly larger forend, the ramped parallel 11 mil 12 mil rib it's not like the most beautiful gun in the world and yet it is like many kriegoffs you pick it up and you feel absolutely dangerous if you are looking for a clay bashing machine there are quite a few in this sale this would be my gun of choice but like with all kriegoffs the proof's always in the pudding i always feel good with most of them but sometimes i just can't connect there's a couple of kriegoffs in the sale this one's like 1609 it's 2800 to 3200 pounds if you paid the top plus commission, you're at four grand. That's a very reasonably priced Kriegel. Alternatively, if you have 2,800 to 3,200 pounds to spend, this really caught my eye. At first glance, I thought it was a Maruku president. And then at second glance, I thought, no, that's a custom Browning. The answer is it sits somewhere between the two. This underneath is a 2012, the Mark 38 traps. This is like the ultimate Mark 38 custom. In 2012, the stock was then ripped off. The forehand was ripped off and it was restocked. So you can quite obviously see firstly that this thing is a European walnut, burr walnut stock. It has that round knob on the bottom. And that round knob is much more of a browning thing than a Maruku thing, although you will see it on some high-end Marukus. Not that you see that many of them at all. Hand checkered, oil finished with a pad on the back. It's 15 and a half inches length of pull, so if you're taller like me, you could just about get away with it. If you are short, well, you could put a longer pad on and make it even longer if you really wanted, but you could also cut it down to length. The gun itself, dimensions-wise, is not so bad. It's got a lot of cast, and it's high enough in the comb you could actually shoot this. I could shoot this. If I can shoot it, most people would be able to shoot it, I would have thought. It's pretty, pretty normal. You see a lot of custom stocking jobs out there to specifications that were perfect for the guy who had it built, but they weren't really perfect for anybody else, which is fine if it's you who's having it, but not so great when you're buying it. So actually, for a custom stock, not bad. The forend is a little longer than usual, which is... Again, nice, presuming that the guy who had a 15 and a half inch stock also had longer arms. The barrels are 30 inch, it was a 30 inch gun with that 10 mil top rib that tapers back into the action. It's the action where it gets kind of exciting and the thing that made me think it was a president, which it's not. It's a fully hand engraved custom job with gold bordering. You have woodcock settling into some ground, you have a gray partridge. I'll say it's a, it's a nice gray partridge, but it does look like it's confused. It's sort of, maybe it's been shot. And on the other side, you have a pair of pheasants flushing from a flowery field. The beautiful scroll run engraving around the outside is all done to a high standard and it's done by a engraver called R. Greco, whose name you'll see across many, many custom guns and some in-house guns by one particularly famous maker. The gun itself, it's not done a great deal. It all clips in well. It's got ever so slight side to side wobble, but hey, it's a 10 year old Maruku, 11 year old Maruku. And a Maruku likes to wobble after it's been shot. It's like a sign of love. It's like a, a Land Rover that has a steering wheel that vibrates when you go more than 30 miles an hour. It's just a thing that should happen after a certain period of time. 
I am undecided on it. Like I think from a financial point of view, it's good value. It would have cost an absolute fortune to build this gun to this specification. I guess I, having immediately thought it was an original custom Maruk, got very excited. And then having realized that it wasn't, I had to de-excite myself. So more objectively, this is a fantastic buy. Realistically nowadays, you're gonna to wanna to send it over to Teague, have it Teague choked and, you know, get it steel proof because those are important things. Do like this gun that pistol grip i'm not really a round knob fan but it's so long when it's when it's in your hand you don't notice it or maybe you're a round knob guy maybe you're a flat knob guy i'm more of a flat knob guy the round knob is not for me right I presume these things are still available but this for those who are newer to shooting this is a precision fit stock nowadays we're used to technical stocks from well five or six different companies uh, sort of who are in the mainstream, fully adjustable bits, different grip sizes, glove grips, you know, fully, fully customizable, cool things. These kind of adjustable stocks make life a lot easier for those who are outside of the box because instead of spending a lot of money in custom gun stock making or stock alteration, which is a bit of a long process, you can just buy it, with, play, play with some wheels, play with some Allen keys and you've kind of got it somewhere close, you can play a lot by yourself. Plus when you come to sell it, you slap it back to normal and happy days, right? This is sort of the father of most of them. I believe this is a precision fit stock. Uh, it doesn't actually say in the catalog, lot 1661. I remember these being all the rage and being a real big deal, what, 10, 12, 13 years ago? It got to a point you could buy them on the internet, you could buy them on eBay, they were at about, I think, 12, 1300 pounds. They were a lot of money back then. Things have come a long way and certainly become more affordable, which is nice. It's interesting to see. It's a real blast from the past when I saw it in the rack, because I obsessed with getting one. And um, I suppose I'm glad that I didn't in a way. But if you want a decent gun and you've got an odd gun fit, lot 1661 comes with a precision fit. Things have moved on, but only in terms of, of beauty potentially or um, ease of adjustability. These are quite simple. All you need is an Allen key set and a Torx key set, and well, you're at no disadvantage. The kick keys on the back has got to the age that all kick keys do, where it just becomes sticky and horrible. That needs changing. I'm not sure at what point I started to like gold guns, and then more importantly, when I started to get a reputation for liking gold guns, but when I walked in, there was a comment straight away about this gun. You have the gold trigger plate, the gold four end iron, and the gold safety catch, all of which are a little bit like that Gamba Gold SP I bought a while ago. Although this is a lot more money than that Gamba Gold SP, so uh, I perhaps won't be partaking in it. However, the gun, the action, the MXA is a very solid thing. It's also case hardened, which is a nice touch. And you have that uh, Woodcock style rib that has the, the cut out in the middle to a floating island bead sight with slightly raised ramps, just to give you that real real accurate, real sure mount for those snapshots. Kind of cool, I think it's certainly kind of cool. Two guns down, we have something that still has gold, but is much more classy. This is a American Pintail 261 out of 500 Anis Akuta. I always like these Brownings with the, with the duck engraving, especially on that trigger guard. I've seen a couple of the different models at Holtz and I've loved every single one. Ducks are always nicely engraved. They're a much more sleeker looking bird than a a pheasant or a partridge or a grouse, it's just, they have more beautiful lines, a duck. So before we go to the other room, there's three guns that I have absolutely no idea why I'm so passionate about. This sale is a particularly good one. I know I say that most times, but this one's got more special and unique stuff. There's nothing wrong with the other sales where we're just looking at the creme to the creme, but what I'm about to show you is uh, different. And the first of those is lot 1801. This is um, in at 300 to 500 pounds. Realistically, it should be over in the sealed bid, but it's not. It's an unsigned, unnamed Belgium hammer gun from 1915. So it's a very late hammer gun as it goes. But you've got this pin and star checkerboard engraving. And honestly, it jumped straight off of the rack and into my hands. What a beautiful thing. The gun itself is a little different. It's a, um, it's a cape gun with one rifle barrel and one shotgun barrel, which is not unusual either. You know, most of the continent use one, and I was watching a Phil Towards Britain, Charlie Jacoby's been doing a bit of a thing with a, a Winchester version. This is a little different in that the left barrel is a 12 bore, and the left barrel's Damascus. This is also a cool thing. The left barrel's Damascus, and the right barrel is fluid pressed steel, and where they're chopper lump, they're stuck together. I don't think I've ever seen that before. That's cool. But the right barrel is uh, 11.15 by 60R, or something. 
That is an obsolete caliber, which means providing you don't use it, I do feel like you'd struggle to get some 115 uh, millimeter ammunition. This goes on a shotgun license as a single barrel shotgun. That is pretty awesome because there's a lot of combo guns out there that are beautiful, but are almost impossible to own because you wouldn't get a slot in your firearms license or they end up getting exported to other countries where they can be part of collections or be used with a little bit more freedom than the UK. I can't help but love this gun. The front trigger is actually a set trigger, although currently isn't working. There's a few little mechanical issues with it, but it's 300 to 500 quid for one of the best looking guns out there. You know, you look at the fences and the carving around the fence, the engraving around the fences is, is pretty beta. And you look at the game scenes and they are, I mean, they're beautiful stags. They really aren't bad at all, but they are perhaps less modern in look. But that stud and star checkerboard thing going on, four. Yes, there's so much to hate, but there's also so much to love. A little bit like this next one, although I think a lot of you will hate this more. You'll have to let me know. Is this a love or a hate? This is a Merkel side-by-side -side shotgun. It is a ejector, which is kind of nice. It's 3,000 to 5,000 pounds, which is, is a fair amount. But again, this gun is a work of art. The checkering, the carving, the deep relief engraving, the trigger tang that flows seamlessly into the lines of the checkering and the, the buffalo horn grip cap, the cheek piece, just wow. This gun represents so much skill and talent. And you know, you ain't probably, as much as I love it, wouldn't own it as my everyday gun. Firstly, you know, when people talk about these expensive guns that they, oh, I would never take a purdy out and shoot it. I take a purdy out and shoot it. It's just a purdy. You know, they're designed to be shot. This is still designed to be shot, but it maybe is too much of a work of art. I don't know. Again, you don't have to love it to appreciate it. What do you think? I think this is a stunner. I really do. I appreciate the amount of talent that's gone into every aspect of this. Three to 5,000, it's a hell of a collector's piece. I guess it's just about how much you like it. And also, how much of a collector you are. This is uh, by far and away one of the most beautiful pieces of gun art I've ever seen. Remember the Moff gun from a few years ago? It's got that kind of flavor about it. Just absolute talent, absolute talent. Maybe not to my tastes entirely, but I could get my head around it. Okay, so I need to put these two guns away to show you the next one because it comes to pieces and I'd quite like to share the process with you. This next gun I am probably gonna put a bid on. Uh, I don't really expect to win it though because the estimate is 500 pounds or so. I think, although this gun might not be the most wildly popular thing in the world, it's got to be appreciated. It's a 1890 Albert Richter 16 bore side by side. Let's go through this front to back and let me try and explain why I think it's cool. Although I think just the look of it is, is pretty. Beautiful. It has 29 inch sleeved barrels with two and a half inch chambers in 16 bore. Two and a half inch 16 bore ammo in the UK at least is fairly common, so that shouldn't be a problem. The sleeving is actually a benefit because I presume originally in 1890 this would still have been Damascus, and even if not, nothing wrong with having newer barrels. The patent act on the action itself is 1884, so this is a very special piece of history. What is awesome is that this is actually a takedown trigger plate action. This is where it starts to get special. All right, you'll like this. Or maybe you won't, who knows. If we break that and take the barrel off, he says. That should then lift up. You've got the little catch on the front. This, uh, it's a fairly common Le showy type of the removal. Where it gets special, or, or different, is probably a better word than special, is this lever on the back here. So if we push this lever across, The gun, this little wedge falls out. Once the wedge has fallen out, put it to one side, and there's a little detent on the front. You push this in, this swivels around and out. She comes, and then, hopefully, technically speaking, the action comes off, and the trigger plate comes out. How cool is that?
See, I think the mechanics on this gun are just as beautiful as something like a Dixon or, or any of these kind of things. The work inside and the finish quality is exceptional, and that's good because it's really not that hard for anybody to get inside your gun. So it best be kind of good. Look at the way that safety catch operates. Isn't that awesome? How can you not appreciate this as a piece of gun making? I really shouldn't be sharing it with you, but just in case I don't win, I like to document the things I bid on, and that's always bad because there's a lot of other gun lovers love this channel. Look at these cocky indicators. So you've got the little sprit leaf springs on the inside, and they connect with the way those hammers cock back and forth, and just pushes them up. That's so simple and so beautiful. The lines of the stock do bits for me as well. They are nice. I actually don't dislike those little raised massive teardrops. I don't really know what they are, but what I do know is I am glad that I have seen this gun. It has been a privilege to share this one with you. A little repair on the stock is where I should talk it down so not everyone bids, but that's about it. Unfortunately, I probably won't be able to win this one, but I will definitely be in the running for it. It's a very simple process. You, you phone up and you register, and then you can either leave a bid with them that they'll bid up to. You can do a phone bid, you can do an internet bid. The uh, possibilities are fairly endless, and these guys will help put you in touch with the correct people to get these guns shipped all over the world, which is good. This is the Antiques Room, home of rare old stuff. From muzzle loaders and swords, to pistols and even cannons. If you look hard enough, you'll also find some very iconic deactivated guns. Unfortunately, antiques is not my domain. Although one day, I'm sure I'll have time to learn. Back to my world. This is a Parker reproduction. Interestingly, I hadn't seen a Parker in the UK for years. Then in the last Holt sale, there were four, and now there's another Parker reproduction, probably put in, I guess, spurred by the success of the last 20 gauge, which was a, another DHE, I believe. But this is a DHE 20 gauge, case color hardened with two sets of barrels. Lot 1561 is, I think, two to three grand, which is not bad money given that it's got the twin barrel set and it is in tidy condition, the action at least. The more I learn about Parker, the more I'm endeared to them. If I actually bought one of the guns out of the sealed bid from the last sale, it could have been the biggest waste of 130 pounds of my life, but I honestly haven't shot it yet. There is something about it. I, I, it's like a classic mini. You know it's not that good when you buy it, but it doesn't matter. Simon, I asked you to bring me a bargain, your bargain of the sale, and you've brought me a boss over and under. That doesn't, maybe they'll be... That shouldn't sit quite well, should it, together. Bargain of the sale, um, or one of the bargains of the sale, and boss over and under. One of the most desirable guns ever made, and there's not that many of them around. Nope. This one is in really nice condition, uh, and... For, it, it, it does sound incongruous when I say that the reserve is £15,000, but 15 grand gets you a boss over and under. Bargain is relative, given <laughs> that a new boss over and under is best part of £200,000, so it's yeah. probably worth putting that in there. And they are special. They are. They are unbelievably special guns. Yeah. We've done plenty of videos on them in previous auctions. If you want to really know a lot about them, go and check that out. But I'll give it to you, it's a bargain. It is. And uh, 1934, 27-inch barrels. Uh, if you wanted to shoot partridges, you would have a massive smile on your face all day long shooting partridges with one of these. This is the Ferrari Dino of guns. Yeah, it is. It's the it thing really that is. just brings you pure joy. It's been outdone in every way, but it yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah, it's... Ah, that's not fair. It's not been outdone in every way. Practicality terms, it's been outdone, but yeah. that's not the same. Yeah, it, that's true. I, it, but it's still a very special thing, and it's in really lovely condition. It's not going to be everybody's budget, but for those looking for one of the finest guns ever made, there it is. As you said to me earlier, you can always sell some stuff. Sell and save. <laughs> yeah, thin out what you've got, save up a little bit. I assume um, that Holtz will be doing Klarna or some kind of other pay-as-you-go <laughs> system, so everyone can buy a boss open under. I doubt that. But, um, yeah, no, it's still it's still worth pursuing when these things come up at this... Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a come and get me price. It's pretty special. Right? There's, there's nothing yeah. about that gun that doesn't tempt buyers in. It so. might be slightly out of fashion um, with the 32-inch, 34-gram uh, load brigades, but quite honestly, they're only going to be buying a certain type of gun. This is going to appeal to connoisseurs. Yeah. 
Um, and, you know, those who shoot 32-inch barrels, so I'm going to defend one myself on. as one of them, <laughs> you can own more than one gun, luckily. You can. So something like this is definitely... You, you can. And yeah. I've, said that, I've said that a lot. There is no point restricting yourself to one gun. If you're into trying to win a world championship, yes, sticking with one gun is a good idea. But actually, to be honest, it's like eating the same meal for the rest of your life or driving the same car for the rest of your life. You'll get bored. For a lot of us, certainly me, and I, I think you too, the joy comes in using things like this. Yeah. It does. Hitting and a few extra clays is all well and good, but I get more joy out of using the thing and enjoying the process of the thing. Yeah, and learning how to dance with it. That's an important part of it. Most people will get a lot of clients who, who will buy a gun and go, oh, no, I can't shoot it. I've, I've had to sell it because I can't shoot it. Well, how much time did you give it? So if you're going to come from a 30-inch you know, heavyweight over and under to a 27-inch partridge gun like this, or grouse gun, uh, you're going to have to learn how to dance with it. But that, guess what? It's worth the effort. It really is worth the effort to try and learn how to shoot so. these things. It's a properly special gun. It is the poster gun. Yeah. It is a bargain of the sale. Even if I can't afford it, something can be a bargain relative, right? It's yeah. like if a million pound house was 500 grand. You might not be able to afford it, but, but it's, it's still, still a bargain. A bargain. <laughs> Just walked over to the sealed bid and only this one room is ready. The viewing doesn't actually open until next week, so about two thirds of it still isn't out. So we're gonna pick a couple of bits out of this room to show you, and we're gonna have to come back for another film later. First bargain spotted, and only because I might need it for spares, is lot 6377. This is a Cromson, you can tell because of the little eagle on the side, a super light model, certainly lighter than my trap gun. The safety catch looks the same, so after Ant broke it, I think I might actually need to put a bid on on that, so just so I can have it, have it for spares. That's depressing, isn't it? Or maybe I'll, maybe I'll prefer that, who knows? All right, I think I found the gun I like the most, lot 6162. It's a Case Keller hardened browning. It's got the round knob, but I've said I wasn't a fan of, but hey, it's on a browning, so I don't mind it half as much. That is a pretty little gun, very nice. Aside from that, the obvious pick is this, 6179, the Ruger Red Label. How can you not fall in love with one of these? I mean, quite easily, but um, the way they shoot is exceptional. No complaints about that. Back in the main auction, it was time to check out the front cover gun. This beauty is an 8x57 Stenderbacker 1905 patent double rifle. It's a bizarre action, but its super low profile is extremely appealing. On top of that, the engraving was something to behold. But as much as I could appreciate it, this next gun really stole my heart. Rather predictably, if you've had a look through the catalog, here is my favorite gun of the sale. This is lot 1660, a Luciano Bosis 28 bore. 72 centimeter barrels, which is 28 and inches and three eighths. So in this stylized floral and acanthus engraving, fully scaled 28 gauge action, straight hand stock, single trigger. There is not much about this gun that I don't like other than I can't afford it. So the estimate on this is 15 to 20,000. No small amount of money. There's no small amount of money. I, I will, every time I have to apologize, every time I'm in this room, I you kind of, lose financial perspective because you know there's guns in here for easy into six figures so 20 it's it's quite reasonable and to look at the new price of one of these being sort of three or four times that plus it's actually not that bad in fact it's more than that it, it will be over 100 grand so this is a true side lock and i understand that actually the, the reality of my life is i'd never never even consider buying one of these but it doesn't mean i can't appreciate it and Every time I see a gun like this, it kind of just makes me re-fall in love with guns. Guns like this just make me quiet and vaguely emotional. I could just sit in its presence and be happy. And that's a good thing. This gun just does genuinely fill me with Joy, satisfaction. It's five pounds, eight ounces. It's got a 15 inch stock. It's quarter and three quarter inch choked with two and three quarter inch chambers. I've said many times that Luciano Botis is one of the greatest gun makers and probably one of my favorite. And, and guns like this really do prove why. They really do. There's a 20 bore in the sale as well, but it's not a patch on this. 
at that top lever, just that beautiful engraving. The way the barrels are struck up, the way the lid ribs are joined in, the BOTIS insignia on the bottom, that cruciform four tip. There's so many people who try and do this or even do it, but it just doesn't look this sexy. And sexy is a really weird word, so I'm not going to use it again. This is as close to gun making perfection as I can see. And you know, there are plenty of guns that fill me with this, this level of happiness. But this one is special. I could certainly sell most of my guns and afford it, and yet I'm still not going to. Maybe I should. The thing is, I really like my other guns too. It's a, it's a hard life, isn't it? It is a hard life. It'd be like selling one of the kids. Um, I'd probably get more for the kids. We're surrounded by some of the best guns in the world, and one of the worst questions that Johnny ever asks me is, pick your two favorite guns. But actually, you can't, in a room like this, pick out just one or two. There's so much here that catches my eye, and I just want to show you one or two now. The first one I'm going to talk about doesn't come in a WNC Scott case. It comes in a Henry Squires and Sons case, but don't let that fool you. This is a WNC Scott Premier Pigeon Gun. Beautifully engraved, all over, lovely fences, and anybody who knows me knows I'm a sucker for a car fence, but that is absolutely stunning. And it is a heavyweight side lock, side by side for competition shooting and i think i could break clays with that really quite nicely uh if the new owner would let me it's in at four to six thousand pounds or it might be three to five i can't remember but it it's not expensive at that price and it will do better than that almost certainly um, but that's one of them the stock isn't epic i mean it's not quite as good as i'd hope it's just it almost looks like a replacement but it isn't um it just has been a little bit too over refinished in my opinion the teardrops have been uh, or drop points have been recut it's just not quite the right colour for me for the age of the gun. So that's just me being ultra picky, quite frankly. Um, but other than that, it's a lovely gun. I will just put it down there and we will walk on and find something else. And me being me, I am naturally drawn to hammer guns. We haven't seen a lot of really good hammer guns in the recent past. I don't know what the reason is, but this is one that has caught many of us. It's a Galleon from about 1870. It's WJ Galleon and it's just... Everything's right about it. It's a really nice looking gun, lovely color wood, just hiding under there waiting to come out. It doesn't need ultra refinishing, none of these guns do, but it is a beautifully made, nice weighted barrels, very nice handling. One of the early rebounding locks, and it's just a cracking piece of gun making. Simon, what have we got here? I've another case side by side. It's, yeah, I know, it's another box lock, and I'm sorry to bang on about box locks. I'm not that sorry, to be honest with you, that apology is misplaced because this is what gets me misty-eyed is this is Harry Morris, or Henry Morris as he was actually known, but Harry Morris as he was known in the Birmingham gun trade. He was an he engraver, right? He was. Yeah. He was a master engraver to the Birmingham gun trade. This is him finishing a gun and putting his name on it. So he put every ounce of his soul into this because this was his calling card. Uh, he didn't do it very often, and it would have been a passion as well. I mean, he's in the trade, and he's th he, he, you can see him working day in, day out, engraving other people's guns, thinking, one of these days I'm going to I'm going to put my gun together that I want to have as my calling card. And it's not flash, it's got a few issues, but it's it's why I love coming into the gun room. Oh, because the, the dog and hair on the trigger guard didn't even see it's that. It's great. That beautiful. It's great. And the finial inlet, it's long. It goes all the way down to the top quarter of the forend, and it's just beautifully done. It's got a scroll back action. It's got my favourite checkering, which is really finely cut flat top diamond checkering. Flat top being the most important part of that sentence, to be yeah. honest with you. It just, it feels right. It doesn't feel like It's just a bloody hard to do, which is It's really nice. tricky to do. And it's... It's just that it's one man's calling card. I and it's lovely. Like it. Yeah. It, it's just a very nice gun, isn't it? It's nothing too spectacular. Yeah. This is the sort of gun you could own and just be proud and of be owning. Very, very happy with. And you don't have to spend a lot of money. This is estimated at six to eight hundred pounds. It's got a heron eating a trout on the bottom. He put herons on things. Morris liked herons and he put a heron on the guns he did, he put herons on. Clearly not fishermen. <laughs> <laughs> This is a lot, 1756, how much is it? And it's in at six to 800 pounds, 600 pound reserve, um, and it deserves to do better than that so because it's a lovely 25 thing. 25% commission on top, You're, you could be in for like 1500 quid if it goes for a rough estimate. You're buying someone's heritage, you're buying a gun maker's or a, a master gun engraver connected deeply with the Birmingham trade, you're buying a piece of his life. That is... And he would want that to happen, I'm sure. I didn't know him, obviously, he's died a long time ago. This was made in 1947, but that is him. So the nice thing about some of these older, more provincially type guns, right, yeah. is they've got a special piece of history. It is much more personal. 
Holland's, yeah. Purdy's boss are undoubtedly great in these sort of big houses. But they're a little faceless by comparison. There's, yeah. there's, there's a lot more prestige going on. Yeah. But you're right, there's something there's very no, personal there's, about this. There's less of a connection, if yeah. we can put it that way. This has connection to an individual, a well-known individual. So another lot that took my eye uh, in this forthcoming sale is lot 1378. It's a pair of German 16 bores by Wurtgartner. But it's not just the fact that they're a beautifully made pair of guns. Not everybody loves the Germanic style, um, but these are really elegant in their own way. The way everything is proportioned, everything is elongated. They just have a style about them that is idiosyncratic and just really beautiful. Um, but the history and the provenance of these is really quite interesting as well. They were the property of the last Duke of Brunswick and they were gifted to uh, a British officer of the Cheshire Regiment at the end of the Second World War for in gratitude for his assistance in keeping the Duke's family out of the clutches of the Russians. So uh, escorting them to safe territory, this was Colonel's present. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing. Um, everything about them has just got little touches of class. Captive cross bolt there, side clips, really cool tops to the balls there. Just gold engraving in just enough to stand out but not be obscene and seeker for safe. It's just a lovely pair of guns. So I don't always go for uh, pairs of guns to be honest with you but I've always been a sucker for a Woodward and I like early patents um, and this is 1891 this is Woodward's automatic. A pair of shotguns lot 1354 classic Woodward arcaded fences and well, that's what we call these little protrusions uh, up here on the balls here. Um, but unusually, you don't often see a uh, side clip on a Woodward, um, certainly not an, an automatic. Um, but also classic traits, you've got this uh, protruding gold inlay cocking indicator and the T safety here. Damascus barrels, uh, gold inlay one and two on each and a really nicely made pair of guns. Uh, Woodward just produced quality all day long. Uh, and as I say, it might look ungainly, but actually there's something quite classy about the way these automatics snap shut. It's a beautiful mechanism uh, and an early patent at that. So a bit of history too, and it comes with a friend um, for six to 8,000 pounds. This is a 12 ball case, and this is a four ball case. It takes some shotgun to be able to shoot these rounds. And right here, I have one with two barrels. Cause we are the outlaws. This is a double barreled four bore shotgun. It's mental, brand new. This gun was over 100,000 pounds and now it sits in Holtz Auctioneers at 20 to 30,000 in almost unfired condition. This gun was made in 2014 and it's 42 inch barrels, 42 inch barrels. Take a four inch four bore case. The gun itself weighs 17 pounds, nine ounces. Interestingly, and here is actually quite an interesting thing, it handles quite well for a 17 pound gun. To really understand the point, we have to look at the history of the four ball. Early in the European conquest of India and Africa, they realized that their standard muskets and rifles were inadequate against the thick skinned and dangerous game. And so in an effort to make bigger, harder hitting guns, they looked at what they already had and they looked at fouling pieces. These guns already existed for shooting ducks and geese for market and personal consumption in four, eight, 10, six, 12, all manner of large calibers. They looked at these and adapted them for their own use beefing them up and making them more ready for larger charges. By the early 1800s, they had perfected these guns. Thick, heavy barrels, big, strong guns, capable of shooting 2,000 grain projectiles out of a four bore. That's a big bullet. A four bore, quite simply, is one pound of lead cut into four pieces, four quarter pound pieces. That quarter pound piece will fit perfectly down the bore of a four bore. That works out to be 25.6 mil or just over an inch. That's a big tube. Obviously, the more balls you have, the lower the caliber. 12 ball, 12 individual spheres of lead. The problem with black powder and a quarter pound ball 
is that you can shove it pretty hard, but to keep pressures reasonable and recoil manageable, it's still a slow projectile. This meant that with certain large animals like elephants, you might need multiple shots because they didn't have the penetration that we expect from modern ammunition. One of the hunting styles at the time, in fact, was to ride in on horseback with a short carbine version of a four ball, shoot and ride away as fast as you could, going back in for a second shot or third shot or fourth shot if necessary. The majority of those early guns were smooth bore. They had no rifling at all. It was just a smooth tube. Getting into the 1850s and rifled four bores became more of a thing. They didn't really catch on as much as you would have thought. The rifling obviously gave greater accuracy, but given that most encounters with large and dangerous game were at 40 to 50 yards, you didn't need any more accuracy than a smooth bore could give you. The resistance met when trying to push a bullet up through rifling meant that you got a slower projectile and more recoil, two things that hunters generally don't like. On top of that, with a muzzle-loading rifle, it's actually slower to reload it, and so until breech loaders came about in 1870s, they were not that popular. Late 1860s and early 1870s were the golden age, the heyday of the four ball, with people like Sanderson and Sellers using them to take elephants. Remembering during that time that elephant hunting and ivory hunting was being properly romanticized. Getting into the 1870s and breech loading came to the fore. Suddenly the four and a half inch four ball black powder cartridge was available. These guns launched the same projectile with the same propellant as the muzzle loader, but you could reload it much faster, giving a faster rate of fire. However, the projectile was still just as slow, just as big, and lacked in penetration the same. And so in 1884, when nitro powder came onto the scene, we saw the development of nitro loads, nitro express calibers. These fired large slugs, not as big as the four ball granted, but very, very fast, giving good knockdown power and excellent penetration. On top of that, the recoil was more manageable and it was smokeless powder, meaning you didn't have this huge cloud of smoke getting in between you and the dangerous game you were pursuing. And so within a few years, the four ball almost died. It exists now as a curiosity with black powder and nitro versions being made in smooth ball and rifled versions by gun makers as, as I said, a curiosity, a showpiece, they are magnificent guns when produced well, and the size and the scale of them is utterly awesome. Until just over a decade ago when Watson decided to join their ranks by making a four ball. Yes. What happened was, I saw these going through auction, and I really love the big ball guns. I saw the prices they were fetching at auction All right. for a basic hammer double four ball, um, 30k plus. Okay. So I thought, well, they're non-ejectors, I thought we could build an ejector, a uh, side lock, single or double trigger, um, 42 inch barreled four bore. Which obviously I looked a lot at the early four bores right, okay. and went from there. They're for high geese is what we're building them for. High geese, goodness me. Well, I have to say, that is unbelievable. You can still pick up those flintlock singles, those percussion doubles, those early breech loaders, but they are rare. You need to keep your eyes on auction sites and you can still buy them new if you feel the need. So back to this double four bore. This gun is a absolute monster, made in 2014 by Watson Brothers in London. It's a true scale four bore, so it actually doesn't look too bad in the grand scheme of things in line. It has a 15 and a three quarter inch stock that is, um, boat paddle worthy. It's an absolute monster, as is the grip. But I guess it would look stupid if you put a 12 bore style grip on it. It's got to be big. The only reassuring thing is the size of the grip and the weight of the gun is that when you shoot this, I doubt it would kick that much and never have I wanted to shoot a gun more. Although I don't think it would be as painful as some of the other things we shot. The action is completely covered in this oak leaf style engraving with a pair of geese on the bottom. It's a lot of steel. It's definitely a lot of steel. You've got side clips here. It's engraved on the breech ends and this giant top lever opens it up to reveal this treble grip action. One, two, and three. To be honest, I perhaps expected a little bit more in terms of lockup, but hey, it passed proof, so I'm sure it's absolutely fine. You clip it and you take the forend off, the forend weighing as much as most 410 shotguns. It is an absolute beast. Very, very pretty metal work, huge release button. This is a big, big old gun. Take that.
that off. It's proofed in metric, which is interesting, at 23.7 millimeter bore. Given that a 12 bore is 18.3, that's an extra five mil in width. That's um, it's a lot of boom. And 101 millimeter long chambers, which is four inch. Back in the day, as we've discussed, the four and a quarter inch black powder was king, but this is actually nitro proofed four bore. London proofed in 2014. It's not steel proofed. That's um, really not the end of the world, given I doubt you'd find four bore steel cartridges. And if you are loading this yourself, chuck some bismuth in there. Um, I don't think it's the sort of thing that you want to do volume shooting with anyway, but it is an ejector, so you can at least ram the next two in there quite well. I mean, just look at the size of the drop points on this. It is a colossal thing. What I quite like, by the way, I completely missed out, the beaded trigger tang runs all the way down into the metal grip cap that is engraved on sweet with the rest with its acorns and oak leaves. Watson definitely engraved some wild looking guns and build some pretty mental things. This is up there with one of the most mental doubles I have ever seen. Why own it? Fun. Nowadays, presume that is the case really, isn't it? Fun. Why wouldn't you want a four bore shotgun? If you can afford one, could it be the ultimate toy? Who knows? Guys, thank you very much for watching and deep diving on the four bore with me. Should this gun even exist? I mean, this gun is just an absolute monster, isn't it? And I suppose there's nothing wrong with owning the biggest thing. I mean, it does, look at this, this comes up to my chest, I'm six foot seven, this gun is over five foot tall. That's colossal. It's gotta be five, three, five, four, in fact. I'll tell you what, let's look in the catalog in which there is no overall length. Either way, guys, I think it's pretty epic. It's pretty stupid, it's definitely dumb, but it's cool. Welcome back to one of my favorite gun places. It is the Holt Sealed Bid Sale. They have over 5,000 lots here, well over 3,000 guns. We're gonna have a little look around today, see what we can see, see what we can find, see what we like, see what we don't. And I'm on a bit of a mission. I've got a shopping list. I can't tell you what's on it. Let's go. First thing I do when the sealed bid online catalog comes up is go straight into the search function. Usually actually leave it a couple of weeks so they get some lots uploaded and search in Purdy, Holland and Holland and Boss. Because I am dreaming one day that these guys will make a mistake, which they won't and put something really delicious in. In this particular sale, there is this. This is an 1874 Purdy hammer gun, a top lever hammer gun. This is lot 7110 with a value of seven to 900 pounds. There's a lot to love about this gun and also a lot potentially to loathe. No, I loathe the wrong word. There's a lot of holes you can pick in it. As we said, it's an 1874 Purdy hammer gun. Sunken rib of saying J Purdy 314 and a half Oxford Street, London. Sounds like something out of Harry Potter. The hammers are rebounding, meaning that when you fire the hammer, it goes forward, strikes, and then rebounds. It means you don't have to pull it to half cock to open it, which is quite nice. The island locks are something I absolutely love. And by island lock, I mean on a lot of guns you'll see the lock is actually attached into the action or goes into the action. This being a back action island lock means that island sits completely surrounded by wood. I think that's absolutely stunning. I really like the engraving around the top lever as well. In fact, the engraving across the bits that aren't um, rotten and striated are quite nice. And herein lies the problem. If you actually look at the action, it's got pitting and striation across its course. The barrels are 27 inch Damascus. And you know, it's a birdie. The Damascus is of high quality, but, and here's the but, they are thin, pitted and dented and black powder proof only. That is um, not so good, that is not so good. Other than the island locks and the fact it's a very beautiful looking gun, it's a 14 and a quarter inch stock and 27 inch barrels, it's a small beautiful looking gun. Small things can still be beautiful. The grip safety I find absolutely awesome. It's a very small period in history where this was even considered a good option. In hammer guns, safety catches on top are fairly rare. You do see some, they had a pair of purdies in the mainsail with a safety catch that you pulled back, which was um, to, to make it go, which was quite interesting. If you pull the hammer back and pull the trigger, nothing will happen. You need to push this safety catch upwards, the grip safety. When you're gripping it, the safety comes off. Take that, pull the trigger, obviously let the hammer down slowly and away you go. The, the barrels aren't that bad. 
they're not just not that good. You could probably buy this gun and save it, or at least buy this gun and get it into a shootable condition. But hey, a thousand pound purdy, there you go. I really could spend weeks in here documenting my way through oddities, weird guns, making a bit of a catalog of weird and wonderful. And this would be at the top of my list if I were to do just that. This is a Valmet 412, which usually wouldn't draw my interest. They're a good quality gun, mostly because you can drop rifle barrels in. The, the versatility of these, the interchangeability of the barrels is wild. In fact, this one comes with three barrels, a 26 inch skeet set, a 30 inch ejector sporter set, and this 36 inch set of barrels. It's got a Monte Carlo stock, the sliding shroud at the top that keeps it locked, a plain action that just says Valmet 412 on. But yeah, these tubes, are they're pretty cool. 36 inches. I mean, I am a fan of 36 inch barrels, it turns out. I mean, I've not shot this, but it's proportional. It's proportionate. The stock's a bit short, the stock's 14 and a quarter inch, but those 36 inches do. I mean, they feel quite lively to be fair. There's no top rib, which is bizarre. I do wonder what they were for, other than compensating. They are monstrous. This gun, unfortunately, is a little bit too much for me to just buy as a curiosity. It's six, five, five, six hundred pounds, four to six hundred pounds, which for a triple barreled set is actually really good value, especially those 36 inch barrels, which are extremely rare. I might put a cheeky bit on it just to see. Next to it is one I don't want to share, but I will. I've always found it funny. This is a feg of Budapest. That's in Hungary. I used to live with some Hungarian guys and Hungary to me is like a country that produces very high-end artisanal craftsman stuff. And yet this could be the ugliest gun in the sale. I remember shooting one a long time ago. Yeah, those triggers are absolutely chronic. I mean, that's, that's a 30 pound gun. In normal world, there's some really nice things here. You've got a load of Berettas, some ultralights, some 686s, some 682s, some Browning Synergies, Satori's. It's not a bad place to just come and buy a very average gun, uh, but it's still a great gun. I say an average gun, a more normal gun than a 36 inch Valmet. A normal stock looks like this, very straight in line with the gun. It's ever so slightly offset left or right so that when you mount it, your eye looks down the rib. This gun has been for a few beers. This is what we call a crossover stock. Essentially, a right-handed shooter who had lost or damaged their right eye and needed to look out of their left eye. I mean, there, there are other options out there as well, but the craftsmanship it takes to make a gun like this is pretty insane. Not only is the stock hard to make and you need to find the perfect piece of wood, but if you look carefully, the locks, the hammers, the top strap, this piece here, the safety catch, the trigger guard, are all bent and folded in line with the gun. I don't think there are many people alive today, if anybody who has the skill to make one of these. Because it's not just about bending it, but getting it regulated so that it works reliably is pretty mental. And when I say no one alive today, because this gun was built in 1885 when crossover stocks were much more common than they are now. The barrels were nitro-poofed or nitro-reproofed in 1958. What an amazing gun. The depressing part, or maybe the interesting part, for, you know, the action is, is worn, the engraving is worn, it's beautiful rose and scroll, or bouquet and light scroll. It's 150 to 200 pounds. That is a beautiful gun for that money, and for any collection or curiosity, that sits right up there. I love the hammers being octagonal at the front, and I love this lever release fore end. How cute is that? It's such a simple thing. I just, I think I might prefer it to the standard lever. Maybe not. There's no preference. I like it as well. Final touch is a heel and toe plates on the back. And um, that side lever action is, is nice. That could be a lot of fun if you get it back into working condition. That would be worthy of a light restoration just to shoot a crossover hammer gun. And hey, even if you never shot it, you own a Blanche, and that's no bad thing. Simon, it's sealed bid time. Uh, this is probably more our cup of tea as a buyer than an enthusiast. Is that fair to say? Yes, um, there's so much to choose from in the sealed bid. Um, I haven't had a proper look around yet because we've just finished the main sale 
yesterday. Now we focus our attention on condition reports for the sealed bids and it's my chance now to have a wander about and find out if there's anything that leaps out. It could yeah. get expensive. It can be, it can be. And there are some, there's, there's often things wrong that you will have to factor in to fix. It's not always the way, but it, it is one of those things that it's, they're cheap, they're cheap for a reason. Um, they're priced to sell a lot of this stuff. So, but there are some bargains. I always look at it as the opportunity to own things I couldn't afford the best version of. Well, there is that, yeah. And there's something nice about doing things up as yeah. well. As a, you know, passion projects. We all like a passion project. Yeah, I mean, if you're anything like me, I have a lot of passion projects that I haven't like moved past the buy it stage. Yeah, that's true. Um, and we have a lot of clients who we also sell gun cabinets to. What have you gone for? Well, I've gone for, it's not terribly exciting, but it is typical of what we were discussing earlier, where there's some good bargains to be had with a little bit, a few issues effectively, but most of them are cosmetic. This is a Beretta 390 Silver Mallard 20 bore multi-choke. It's the sort of thing that, you know, my kids are gonna be progressing to. Soft recoil, good starter gun, nice to shoot. Very shootable. Very shootable, multi-choke as well. Doesn't come with the spare chokes, but these chokes are available where I mean, they're 10 a penny. Exactly, exactly. Brand they're around. They're 40 quid, second hand you can buy a set for 40 quid. Exactly. The only real issues with this are a couple of very light marks on the receiver and the finish, the matte varnish, has gone slightly milky on the stock. And if yeah. you strip it, you could do that yourself. What's that, 250, 350, something like that? Something like that, 6538 is the lot number. Good gun. The other end of the spectrum, <laughs> this is a Ithaca Model 37. It's a 16 gauge variant with a thing. I don't like the thing, I feel like that ruins it. Yeah. Without it, Compensators. it would be a good looking gun. I have a few American correspondents who all rate this as the best bomb action ever made. And I've never shot one. Not in a time when I didn't just shoot it and not pay any much attention to it because it was just a stinky old American gun. Yeah. Now, that's more of a connoisseur. <laughs> Pump actions are fun, there is no doubt. They are fun to shoot. A rack in the slide for your next shot, it sometimes takes you time to get your head around it if you're used to, to run over and under. Um, and they, these Ethicas were a little bit more robust than most, weren't they? It is nicely made. Yeah, like, a couple of scratches down there. Is that a crack or is that a scratch? That's no, just a scratch. Okay, cool. It's what, 80 years old? That's, yeah, it's it can have a scratch. Oh, it's okay. got, it's yeah. got some age behind it, hasn't it? So we'll forgive it a few blemishes and a few knocks. I understand that as a pump, most people will be looking for something more abusable, but this will take the abuse and it's Corby's history. Yeah. It's on my list. It's 16 and that inherently makes it a bit more nicky, but that's okay. Yeah, but I mean, everyone complains the cartridges for 16 bore are expensive. They're not, relatively. They're around, they're not any more than the 20 bore cartridge. You know, the top of the range game load is gonna be much more expensive than your average 16 load. So it's always that myth of, oh, they're too expensive to shoot. They're not really, you're not gonna be pumping 10,000 rounds for it a year. No, are they're, you? they're, they're not play fun. guns, No, that's for sure. Well, they are for you. <laughs> That'll shoot out. So I've dragged these aside because I think that this pair of guns might be the buy of the sale. You know, they're a bit odd, but they are 1,200 to 1,500 pounds, lot 6412. That's 1,200 to 1,500 pounds for two guns. And when I tell you these guns are in 20 bore with 28 bore sets of barrels to go with each, I found that quite exciting. I am showing them to you so that hopefully I can't afford them. I think these are wonderful guns. They are very simply Italian over and under, sorry. They are a match pair and the matching is actually pretty good by the look of it. I think the number one gun is prettier or certainly prettier in the woods. So that is the one that we're gonna look over. They have 13 and a quarter inch stocks. There you go, there's the big downside. That's why they're probably in here and not in the main sale. The stocks are oil finished, very beautiful pieces of walnut, lovely sleek lines with grip caps, full extended trigger tangs, single selective triggers, and you know, I don't even hate the uh, selector that much. I do, I mean, a non-selector would be far, far, far more gentlemanly. The guns are marked one and two, or one, one and one on the fore end, so you don't mix up the parts. That's quite an important thing with pairs where they look identical, but probably aren't regulated identically that you get the right barrels on the right guns and that's fine. I often get asked why you can't interchange them, and certainly in certain brands you can, but in the more hand-finished guns, that just is not an option. The action, barrels, stock, and all the work, it's laser checkered, by the way, is done by Fratelli Poly, who we saw at Catcher Village, which is very exciting, because we don't see many of them in the UK. And in fact, this one wasn't even destined for the UK, because on the bottom, it is branded as Kevin's Plantation Collection. It's got a 
quail on the bottom were very nicely laser done, we're not going to argue that out. And it was imported to the USA by British Sporting Arms Millbrook, New York. On the bottom you have FPA marked for Fratelli Poly Army and 28 bore 70 mils. These are the 70 mil 28 gauge barrels. This gun was made in 2013, so it's only a decade old, which I was chatting to someone younger than me the other day and they referred to a 10 year old gun as old. And I realized I was selling guns 10 years ago, and that's pretty sad for me. I like the skinny ribs. It is ventilated on the top, solid on the mid. And the action is built by Poly, but honestly, the design just looks like Rizzini based style gun coming out of Valtrompia. I like it. I think it represents great money or great value for money. My only gripe is that stock length, um, but I'm a big man. You could have it extended. It does have a 5 8 inch pad, which is a, a bit of a bugger. It would be a big wedge you'd put on the back. But if you think if you put a nice wooden extension on there, you wouldn't be in for a massive amount of money for a very pretty usable pair of small bore guns. Not that you particularly need a pair of small bore guns, but why not? You know, we could rip them apart. There's a, a slight wood to metal fit issue. It's not too perfect, but this is a hand built or very much hand finished pair of very reasonably priced guns in 20 and 28 bore. I'm spitting with those. So this next choice that's poked out at me is 7152. It's an SW Silver & Co. underlever hammer gun from 1885. Bold Damascus barrels, lovely looking thing. Really nice, a little bit of colour left on the action. Brown's lovely as well. Brown's nice, colour under the hammers, bit of dirt here and there. It does have one significant issue, however, which it's a side is... side-by-side. Side. It's the crack through the hand, there. Repair? It's, re it's not repair, it's not wobbling. You can't feel that wobble, um, but it's being pinned almost by the extended top tang, the island lock plate, and the trigger guard tang as well. It's all holding that together. Now that wood pin, there are people out there who can do amazing things with woodwork. Pin and glue that, and you've got a really nice gun. Four to 600 pounds because it's a good looking hammer gun. Classic lines, classic elegant. SW Silver, interesting maker, more famous for the orange recoil pad, the silver's recoil pad. Same really, company. that's very interesting. Yeah. Imagine your legacy as a gun maker being the pads he used. <laughs> yeah, well, I know. Um, so yeah, that's what's followed him yeah. down the history and down the years. But really nice flat top, fine cut checkering, nice looking thing. The rib is stunning, yeah. wide, uncheckered, but just beautiful. Just lovely. The thing flows properly. That's a properly built, properly made gun, my kind of thing. I have gone a bit more weird and wonderful. You have. Uh, this is, I mean, I want to point out something, right? So it's made in school, and it's made by a company called Gecardo, but you have to turn it upside down to be able to read the name. <laughs> this is a proper right hand shooter's gun. It's a over and under 29 and a half inch 1920 built gun. And it's solid, look at it. <sighs> and more over, it's just that action carving does weird stuff to me. That is I can see why. There's a lot of work that's gone into shaping that heading up stock, making it fit. Yeah. The shape as it flows through and moves around and the top bolster yeah. of the action moving into the barrel, that's and a nice touch. Usually those bolsters I don't like too much. It's a bit proud, but where you've got that double stepped action, it's It complements it, doesn't it? Yeah, and the engraving is nice. The bordering works. It's a well-designed gun, cocky indicators. There's touches of class on this. So there's a little tip to the top tang there yeah. that flows down, mirrored at the point where there is no drop point. It's quite tasty. And that is yeah. a nice, elegant mirror. There's symmetry all over it. The top lever, as it joins the action under here, you've got beautiful symmetry of line there. It's just a lovely thing. It hides its depth well, and that forend is really beautifully proportioned. It it's a stunning gun, three to 500 quid, nitro-proof. Three... Love that. 70 mil chamber. It's a bit of a geeky gun, yeah. but you could enjoy it. You could. It's a totally usable modern gun. And the stock specs aren't terrible. It's totally shootable. I find most Merkles come in like rest on your chin stock. This, you could actually, I could shoot it. Yeah. And that's good enough for me. And there are a lot of people who can't get their head around double triggers if you've, if you've grown up and always used a single trigger. Yeah. But actually, and I was explaining this to a client the other day, the fastest barrel selector ever made, yeah. double trigger. I, You're not I, fasting around with a little yeah. tab trying to push it over or a safety catch moving to the left or to the right. You just go bang, move back, bang. Are we going to discuss the glaring issue with it? Do you want to mention the problem? Not that big a problem, is it? It's there, and we probably ought to point out that <laughs> it's got a massive crack and warpage on the forehead. Yeah. If you hadn't had that pointed out in a condition report, you'd be pretty upset. We would be mentioning that kind of problem. Your crack stock yeah. is more of an issue than a crack forehead. True. Structurally, a stock is more important, True. obviously, than a forehand. 
but they're both repairable. Yep. And I mean, that is just a work of art. For three to 500 pounds, that's a cracking gun. Sometimes you walk into the sealed bedroom and something jumps off the shelf that you shouldn't like. Like this. This is being affectionately referred to as the Guilt Ridden. It is underneath an Army Jaeger M1622 copy, but it's had a hell of a paint job. Look, I don't know whether this is done in good taste or not, but it is a, it's just an interesting thing, and I had to share it with you because it's a curiosity. It's got a custom camouflage stock with the honeycomb back on it. I mean, that, that's a lot of work's gone into this. You have all these custom stickers all the way around the outside, I'm not in stickers, they're cutouts, which is interesting. All of the metal is gun metal war and finish. They've taken the black off and then polished it in certain areas. It certainly looks aged. It's, it looks like some kind of apocalypse paint job. You have Heathen written on the side of the, the mag there. The mag is actually a dummy. Look in the bottom, there's, there's, there's the hole for a 2-2 mag, which is, uh, you know, interesting. You have Away With You written on the side. A lot of effort has gone into this gun for a 2-2. I admire that if nothing else. The forward has the same custom paint job with a crosshatch finish around the, the finger groove there. And on the bottom you have guilt ridden written. I don't hate how much effort has been put into this and I feel guilt ridden for liking it. It's probably time to admit I have a problem. I walk into that room and any step-up rib trap gun from 1985 to 1995, I seem to be drawn to. I don't really know why. I think it's because they are kind of ugly and obtuse and old, but still very capable. They are interesting. This is actually a gun that I once shot very regularly. This is a Winchester 8500 trap. I'm a fan of these. And this one is no exception, although this one does feel slightly different to the one I used to shoot. It's certainly heavy. This gun is nine pound, 15 ounces. Well, and everything on this gun is big. It's lot 6142. And it is 125 to 185 pounds, which is an odd you know, valuation, but there is a reason why as well. It's a, it's a little loose, but we'll get to that in a minute. The fore end weighs as much as most 410s. And these 32 inch barrels, which will be choked ridiculously full and ridiculously full, will pummel stuff. I can attest to that very well. I like the stippling on the back. I've always liked the sight picture of a step up rib. There is something about the, that way that soaks up the light and leads you into the front end of that very long, non-tapered rib. Some ribs, have this really like cross hatching. These guys went for like went for it. You could use this as a file and get away with it. It is proper. Single bead sight at the front, and vented mid rib as well. The action is plain on them. It's plain black, but it's got this silver borderline and then some engraving around the, the trunk of the front. I think it's a really classy looking gun, really classy. I've also liked that te matte textured finish runs all the way around the back of the action and onto the top lever. It's just, it's a nice to have that contrast. You see it on certain modern guns now where they use laser stippling to give you a matte finish and then they mix it with hand polishing. It's a nice thing. It, it works. It gives you all the feeling of of niceness without just having a rough action all over. The stocks were very nice pieces of walnut. I think they're very nice pieces of walnut. This one has been weighted. No walnut in the world is that heavy. Like, <laughs> this is ridiculously heavy. I'd love to take it apart and see quite how much weight was added. It's a great gun and at that money, it would be the gun I'd buy out of this sale to add to my ever-growing collection of useless old trap guns that aren't useless. It is loose on the face and by loose on the face, I mean, Every gun is jointed from a hinge to a flat face, and that flat face needs to be flat and tight against the back of the action so no gas escapes. This is for safety, longevity, and also recoil. If that, ga that gap is loose, this gun will kick. Winchesters are sloppy anyway, so everyone will pick up a Winchester and just open it and close it, and it will feel like an absolute bag of spanners. But, but honestly, coming from shooting Winchesters when I was younger and Brownings and Marukus, I kind of used to a gun that just flops open and closed, I quite like it. The problem is when that's closed is it should be tight, tight as you like. And you can hear that, it's not that way, and it's not that way, that is not good. You can actively see light between the barrels and the action. This gun needs a rejoint, and that is why it is cheap. 
A rejoint wouldn't be too expensive. Four to 500 pounds on one of these would have a very good job done. There are temporary fixes you could do. I would rather you didn't do that to this beautiful old piece of history. Last thing, and this is very cool, the trigger is half checkered on the right hand side. Again, little classy things that Winchester did to their top end gun. Those 1980s Winchesters were special. I picked two. That's cheating. Yeah, but mine suck. But they're, <laughs> they're, they're vaguely interesting. So you're doubling up. Yeah, and you've probably picked something much nicer. Do you want to start, Jimmy? Uh, I'll do you one. Um, so I'm going to start with this one first. This is actually not interesting to anybody but me. But actually, no, the other one is less interesting. This is a Breeder Vega Lusso. Keen-eyed viewers will see that it looks an awful lot like a Beretta 686. And that's because it is a Beretta-made gun, Breeder-stamped. However, unlike other people who've done that in the past, who've kept the styling exactly the same, their raised half side plate, as they call it, is a completely different shape. And then they've completely failed to bleed that line into the stock, which that upsets would have been me. Nice. But I do think that's quite yeah. pretty. That's a nice touch. It's a little bit more rude than the yeah. standard it's, it's version. It's half a nice touch, isn't it? It just needs to go on. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> they like, well, we've got enough budget to machine the actions differently. Yeah. But it is interesting. Uh, not many people well, Brett may go into quite a few people, but they're yep. not anymore. This is one of them. It's one of them, yeah. And it's 6250, and it's a couple of hundred quid for a 686. You can't really argue with that, can you? Because you know what no. you're getting. Uh, I did notice the multi checks missing. But it's again, it's, it's, a, it's one of those mobiles, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, you can so. go to your local gun truck, they'll have a bin of them. Unless Breeder decide to use their own choke, which in which case you won't. <laughs> <laughs> go on then, what you So got? I have gone for an Englishman that isn't English. Continental in origin, retailed by W. Richards of Liverpool. This is an English over and under, made either in Belgium or in France. Josh and I are thinking in French. It's not pretty in a way a boss over and under is pretty. <laughs> It's a little bit bulky there, but there's touches of quality and touches of class. Mm -hmm. I've seen I've seen similar mm -hmm. um, retailed by well-known English makers. W. Richards of Liverpool was a highly respected maker. Oh, yeah. 250 to 350 pounds, I think it is. It's lot 6230. It, at the moment, I walked straight past it, came back to it, walked past it again, came back to it again, Just looked it up and went, ah, oh, that's more interesting than I thought. And that is typical of the seal bit, yeah. is you go, oh, that's not quite what I first thought. Yeah. I feel embarrassed to show you my second gun now. Cool. Go on and get it out. This <laughs> is 30 to 50 pounds. Well, it would want to be. At a distance, it looks like every other cheap, nasty Spanish over and under. But this one is different. Okay, how different is it? Uh, this is lot 6278. It is a D-arm, die arm, which is interesting. So, short history lesson, the Spanish gun trade was not doing very well. So they all banded together, other than three makers, and said, we're going to create a gun-making conglomerate with our combined might. It didn't go very well. There are reports that they made no guns, up to the reports making a few thousand guns. The government gave them a lot of money, and they had a lot of money and equipment to start with. It's a bit of a black hole. We went out to Spain and no one wanted to talk about it, which is what oh. intrigues me. There's very little on the internet other than the same regurgitated shite from books. Oh. And this gun has Dion written on the side. Dion was the name of that very company. Okay. This proves they at least made one gun. You know, we're talking Spanish gun making in the late 80s. They were still on the price war. It's not nice in the slightest, but it's not absolute poo either. No, it was budget then, it's still budget now. Yes, but budget has... Maybe budget's not got any better. For £50, I will be bidding on this. Okay. Um, mostly so I can use it as like an inspiration until I actually finish this bloody film on Spanish gun making. <laughs> but it is an interesting thing. Okay. Uh, very niche. Yeah. Very, yeah. I don't think there's room for many other people in your niche. But, you know. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> I resent bringing it out now. <laughs> it's worth saying that there are some of the best well, at least guns in the world here. At least it's between us and you didn't do it in public. So Holtz isn't just about shotguns. Over the years we've looked through their air rifles, we've looked through their rifles, and this time I have a particular fascination with a couple of guns that I am actually going to be hunting for for personal use, as well as a few video ideas I have. And here are two examples of things I'm actually after. This is an Enfield 303. I was actually trying to find myself a 577 450, but there is something about the acquisition of ammo or having to load it and the black powder thing, having to clean it a little bit more thoroughly that potentially put me off that. But they've got half a dozen 303s here, some of which I quite like. This is lot 4970 and actually comes with a Metford bayonet, which is, yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? 
So you can take that off and, and run around. But it's an artillery carbine. You know, these things were in service all the way until 1918 around our empire at the time, and certainly for training and marksmanship projects. It's, it's a pretty cool thing. This one was actually nitro-proofed recently, and it's £350. I think it's a bargain for an old gun. The problem I find with buying anything like this is a shotgun, providing you measure the barrels, it's going to shoot. And if not, it doesn't shoot, it's going to go click and you can make it go bang. The problem with something like this as well, and this is this is 250 to 350 pounds, this is a pretty rough one, I don't know why I picked this. This is a short Lee Mark III, is whether they shoot or not. And that for me is a, a big question because I don't really know the answer. I know you can look and I know how to test them and I've looked down plenty, but I know what one that will shoot looks like and I know what one that won't shoot looks like. But a one that will shoot is quite a big bracket and the one that won't shoot is quite a big bracket. You know, it's not on or off. There's a lot of gray area between pinpoint accuracy and you know not being able to hit that at 50 yards. I guess the only way is to use your common sense, look at it, best judgment and chuck a bid in. These guys will do you condition reports on them, but again, they're not gonna go out and shoot it and give you a group. This is why Lee Enfields are certainly cheaper at Holtz than in certain shops, because with a shop, there's gotta be an accuracy guarantee. Or at least, hopefully, you'd hope. I have wasted a lot of money over the years on guns. And I say wasted, it's not a waste. If you buy something and sell it for less money, as long as you enjoyed it for the gap of money, as we've discussed, that's absolutely fine. But, uh, yeah, buying a gun and then never selling it, that, that could be a waste, certainly if you don't use it. And I've done that with a few things. They do bring me joy to go and have a rummage through my, my pile occasionally. And this is one gun I want to add to my pile in, like, the vain hope that one day I do something with it. It is a lot 6410. A Beretta S04. As you can see, it's not really a SO4. SO4s are a true side lock over and under by Beretta. They are a fantastic, fantastic gun. I am a, a big fan of one. I owned one for a short period and I've been smitten with the SOs ever since. If ever I had a load of money, I'd own another one. This one's four to six hundred pounds, and so it's obviously appealing because I could afford to own it. However, a uh, big however. It's got no stock and it's got no trigger guard and it's not like the 687WLL where you can buy a stock on eBay. You can buy stocks for these that will require some fitting. They're better than other side locks for fitting because of the way the bridles are all self-contained. But, and the resounding but, is just they don't come up. And a new SO4 stock isn't like a 680 series stock that's reasonably priced. It's a lot of money. You could get one made, you know, if you went to someone like Manuel Ricardo, you're in for 1500 maybe to two grand. You could own an SO4 for two and a half thousand pounds with spare barrels. But I don't know whether that's too much. I think mean, this is the problem. I just don't know whether it's worth the investment. If you did the work yourself or you had an SO4 you needed spares for, this could be a really good buy. And it's definitely worth the investment to get a custom stocked S04 with a twin set of barrels. This gun, by the way, is 1974 and the spare barrels are from 1968, so they weren't born together. Yeah, no, it, it is what it is. I was desperate to come and see it, hoping that I'd feel a, a rush of inspiration, be like, yeah, get your tools out, make a stock for it. And I just haven't. I think if the rest of it was minty or a slightly better gun, I, I might be interested, but I think maybe it's the cellophane. And that could be the, uh, the sad thing there. But genuinely, you could buy it and say you own a 6.8, but genuinely, there you go. This is a real interesting one. And there's things like this that actually endear me to Holtz. Interesting, it actually has a little plaque with it. I wonder, I presume that belonged in the original stock. Who knows what the history of this gun is. It's definitely something I'd like to own. And definitely something I, I wish I was like a billionaire and could just do stupid stuff by buying and refurbing things that make me happy. But if I was a billionaire, I'd own a new one. Um, so I suppose that's not the game. I was just browsing the Enfields, trying to find one that looks the best, but isn't six or seven hundred pounds, because obviously the better condition ones are worth more money. And I found two guns that I quite like, but I also then turned around and stumbled into this lot, 2090. I'd seen this on the website. It is a Manu France, a Brevet Ideal in 24 gauge. 
when your four gauge still exists on the continent as something that is pretty common, trying to find fiber rod 24 gauge is a little harder, but the plastic rods are, are all there. It goes hand in hand with 32 gauge as a weird curiosity. I know that's quite big in America as well as the continent. Interesting in England? Interestingly in England, absolutely nobody wants it because the ammunition is almost non-existent here and what we do get is imported. So much so that this gun is an off ticket gun. This is a non-licensable gun because it's an obsolete caliber 24. But you could buy it, put it on your license and go out and have some weird geeky fun. I mean, if you thought the 16 ball was a bit edgy, this is the most edgy. This was a mullet before mullets became fashionable again. And I've seen 24 balls shot by a, a very nice Belgian gentleman and he absolutely nailed birds. Obviously, 24 ball gauge sits between 20 and 28. So you're looking at 23, 25 grams, three quarters of an ounce max, that kind of thing, just over three quarters of an ounce. You can't really be picky with the ammunition choice because, well, it's one of those you get what you take things. Little lever breaker, Honestly, you could own this as a pretty thing to just stick on your wall in a secure fashion, obviously, or semi-secure fashion. It's not like a non-obsolete caliber gun, but fascinating. Haven't seen one at Holtz before, seen a couple in real life. The 32 is the one I'd really like, but a 24, and this is 300 pounds, it will be a nice thing to own. I am so disappointed in this gun. I um, saw it in the pictures and I thought that could be very interesting. This is a Renato Gamba Oxford 90, a um, side by side. Renato Gamba made some very fine over and unders and I believe their name was perhaps on some Spanish side by sides at one point. And this one I was kind of excited to come and see. Uh, a new model, you never know. Every time you come and see something new, it's a roll of the dice. 6678, I say disappointment. It's six, four to 600 pounds. It's not a ridiculous amount of money. It's worth mentioning that it's also a 20 gauge, so it's actually probably better value given that 20s in small gauge side by sides are always at a whopping premium. It's got 27 and three quarter inch barrels. It's got a 14 and three quarter inch stock of which the line is very nice. It's not a badly made thing. Just the engraving is pretty depressing. In fact, the quality of it is perhaps not where one would expect. I do think that SAB Renato Gamba, they have been known for making various qualities of guns up to top quality. I've seen with their London guns, it's called London. That was quite nice. This one is, there's nothing inherently wrong with it, but it just feels cheaper than I expected it to. You know, the barrels are actually really quite nice. There's nothing wrong with the way this gun is built. I think it's just finished, finished to a different taste. And then you've got the way that Renato Gamba Gardone VT Brescia Italy is put on top. It's just there's certain markers about it that it just feels a bit budget and it probably is So I really shouldn't argue. I think I was just disappointed. I was expecting something great The gun has done very little. It locks up nice and tight. There's no shake. It's clean. It's very very clean It's actually a good purchase at the money But when you big something up in your head, it's, uh, it's always disappointing when it lets you down, isn't it? And that's a bit miserable, but I'm not let down, it's a good gun. I suppose I'm always just looking for a bargain, but not the end of the world. It is a single trigger 20 bore side by side with a decent length stock and relatively decent barrels with a flat hand filed rib. These are things I can get behind. 100% I could shoot it and shoot it to a decent standard, which I can't say for most 20 gauge side by sides, given that most are old and finished 100 years ago for small people. That is good value. You just might want to paint it black. There's a couple more guns in here I do want to share with you. Things that I would actually put my money into if I didn't already have one or two even of them. And the first has blended delightfully into the background. This is a Gamba Gold SP. Many of you will remember I bought one of these, but the gold plated version. I tell you what, that is a fantastic gun. I absolutely love that gun. The slight step, the handwork that goes into it, obviously because I'm an idiot the detachable trigger. I um, I can't help but think they represent great value for money. I think this is 300 to 400 pounds, lot 6387. They are a fantastic gun. They were a fantastic gun, certainly. I can't see a, a reason why you wouldn't buy one of these Fratelli Gambas. The slight palm swell, it's such a shootable gun. I'm sorry, but I'm about to show you another 
small bore sub gauge gun. I've been asked by a couple of people recently why we've done so much on the channel with them. And I think I'm just going through a bit of a phase. And so I do apologize, but they are genuinely a little bit more beautiful sometimes. I like a big obnoxious 12 bore, don't get me wrong, but there is something nice about a sub gauge. This one being a 20 bore Cogswell and Harrison, the Victor Extra Grade or something along those lines. It's a side plated Acanthus scrolled box lock. It's it's a lovely little gun and you know, for two to three hundred pounds or whatever it is, lot 6523, it jumped off the shelf at me. It has got the relatively average Cogswell single trigger that you'd have to live with. And you know, maybe this wouldn't be a gun I'd actually buy, but it's certainly one that I'd want to like a little love affair with. It's got the Cogswell ejector work, which I don't know why I picked it up now. I'm supposed to be being nice about it and I want to be nice about it. And I'm very quickly changing my mind the more I'm having flashbacks to working on these. It is nice though, like as guns go, Cogswell produce a very nice looking box lock gun, occasionally with side plates. And you can pick those up for relatively good money. And as a first foray into English guns, if you're after a gun that looks great, I mean, look at that. Look at how that third bike clips in with the top lever. If you're after a gun that looks beautiful, that you're rarely gonna use, and you're not gonna get too angry if it does break, this is a great option. If you want a gun that is less beautiful, but works all the time, buy a Webley 700. Now I suppose that's, it's just horses for courses, isn't it? It's, it's the same with modern over and unders. Some are designed for looks, some are designed for strength, some sit in the middle, but there's always gonna be a preference around those things. This is a lovely thing. It has been refinished at some point, but really quite nicely and sympathetically. It's just a good gun for the money providing it works. And that's just me being skeptical because I'm sure it does. I think I've just spent too long inside these things over the years. And yet every time I see one, I just think that's good looking. And then I have to slap myself. I saw this on the website as well. I probably spent too long on the Holtz website. More importantly, me and my friendship circle then we all ping the highlights over to each other. This is lot 6639. This is a um, M66 Super Single 20 gauge Ithaca Gun Company. It's a three inch 20 bore, magnum proof, single shot. And it looks pretty racy with that under lever. The lever is just to open the gun. A lot of the time you'll see the little push levers, little pull up levers, they're actually not very tactile. This is the best way of actually making an extended lever reasonably priced that doesn't feel awful. It's got an external hammer. That must have been cut off. Yeah, that's been cut off. That's not very tactical otherwise. But actually, the line of it, I don't hate it. I and mean, this is 20 to 30 pounds. Obviously, it's a silly gun. But to buy, like, we call them inter-auction purchases. You buy it and stick it back in the next one once you've had your fun with it. You could definitely have fun with that. It's not good, but it looks good. Ever since shooting 410s in Casa de Campo, I have become obsessed with finding one that I will actually be able to shoot and enjoy. Given the differences in how some of the ones I shot out there handled, it's, it's evident that as a bigger guy, certainly shooting a smaller gun, you need to find something that's, that's perfect. You can't get away with bad gun fit or anything like that. It needs to be right. However, I'm still endeared to things like this, which are fun. This is what 6691, a 1948 built Winchester Model 42. I chucked something on my Instagram a few weeks ago about buying a 410 and I had three people say, this is the one to buy, they bring you so much joy. And that might actually be the case. It might not be the wisest choice, but the lines of this little classic pump action are wonderful. They're extremely reliable from what I understand. And that ribless barrel is, um, it's cute. It's definitely cute. The controls, however, aren't super slim. You see uh, other makers who are making pump action 410s and 22s, well, more what a other maker. And that forend is, is a touch small. This still feels as though you could use it in earnest, the grips, the pumps, everything. It's four to 600 pounds. It would be a whole heap of fun. It's mag restricted as well, which is nice and comes with a little bit of history alongside. Non-checkered grip, rough cut four in plastic buttstock. It would be a shame to get one of these and modify it to fit because although they made tens of thousands, it, um, Always feels weird cocking up a bit of history. It's why I'm happy in the, the 80s and the 90s because those guns are cheap enough that, and still common enough that you don't mind making them fit and hacking them about a bit. This would be, I mean, it's not a shame if you're gonna use it in earnest to make it fit. That's never a shame, it's never a waste, it's never destroying history, but I don't have enough nice old guns to start hurting them.
Simon, you have a bit of a success story when it comes to a sealed bid buy, and I would like for you to share that with people because I think it's quite cool. Okay, I will. Before I started working at Holtz again, I worked for Holtz 24 years ago, left to do other things, and then started getting into competition clay shooting and was looking to find a cyber side that I could shoot clays regularly with because I prefer shooting cyber sides. Actually, the way my eyes work, I actually like the fact that my left muscle of my thumb and the left barrel block out my left eye because in certain situations, my left eye has a tendency to want to start playing the game and I really don't want it to because I'm a right-handed shooter. Uh, so I've always been on the lookout for the right kind of gun. And six years ago, I found one in the sealed bid and managed to pick it up and I didn't pay a lot of money for it. And really that is the lesson of the sealed bid is you don't have to spend big money to get something that's very functional, very usable and can win you a little pot. So I bought a W.J. Jeffrey. Oh, which is a really well-respected maker. He uh, Very well-respected for his rifles, but also made very, very good quality mm -hmm. um, side locks as well. This is a gun that appears in his 1906-1907 catalogue, which I've got a copy here, as his long-range pigeon gun. They marketed it as a pigeon gun. Long-range pigeon gun. And it's 30-inch barrels. It was tight choked. This has actually been sleeved. And for those who don't know, sleeving is when you take off the old barrels that are worn out and you machine back and put new tubes on and relay a rib, which gives it a little bit more heft up in the barrels. So it's, it, it's quite a deliberate gun to point and mm -hmm. quite a deliberate, deliberate gun to shoot. I like that for clay shooting because it's a totally different exercise to game shooting. In my opinion, I shoot game and clays very, very differently. It's a much more deliberate and controlled movement and a heavier weight barrel for me promotes that kind of deliberate controlled movement. Anyway, so I picked it up for 325 quid plus commission and have shot clays with it ever since and just thoroughly enjoy shooting clays with it. And I was lucky enough at the English Open this year to get myself into a shoot off and win the side by side championship at the English Open. So with a 325, with a 325 pound, pound plus commission 120 gun. 120 year old gun. Yeah. It's actually the number two grade of Jeffrey's long range guns. They marketed it in two grades. The higher grade, number one grade, had much more engraving on it and it was a very good looking gun. I'd love to find one of those one day. But this is the number two grade marketed as a planar action, less engraving, all other particulars remain the same, is how they, how they put it. Um, it's a three inch chambered gun. It's choked five eighths and seven eighths. It's damn near full in the left barrel. So when you connect, you connect. There is no doubt. There's no chipping of stuff. That's a good <laughs> confidence boost, right? It is, yeah. yeah. And for those who haven't shot in an open or one of the bigger competitions, the targets that sort out the prizes and sort out the podium spots are the long ones. Yes. Um, you have to put in the, you have to get as many of the uh, average targets yeah. Take, take scores take on your cards. Take the tens if you can. Um, but when you've got a 60 yard looper coming off high off a bank, that one is going to work out who is and who isn't at the end. Yes. And a side by side is generally not people's choice for no. that. However, that gun. But does this gun is built for exactly that target. Doesn't feel good. Yeah, it does. It feels like a clay gun. You've picked it up, you've yeah. shot it. Oh, you yeah. know what I mean. It doesn't feel like most side by sides. It's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because you, we always say side by side this over and under that. But that's actually complete and utter manure because. You get an over and under that handles so fast, so whippy, has all of the characteristics that are more cyber -sided. Yeah, If you put a big four end on it and told people it was an over and under sighting plane, everything about it moves very yeah. similarly. It is over and under like in many respects, but it's still a classic English hammer gun. Yes, it's uh, it does good quality. Look exceptional as well. And it's got nice lines, it's got a nice pistol grip. The stock is nice and lean through it. It's not fat in the comb. I had the, sh the extension that to fit me because, you know, we're taller than the people of 1910, 1906. Mm. Um, we have McDonald's. Uh, we do, but we also, we're wearing performance materials now. We're not wearing thick wool coats. Yeah. We're wearing Gore-Tex coats, which are much, much thinner. So almost everything needs an extension on. Um, and I had the stock extension particularly shaped because I like a nice defined pitch on the back of my stock to fit my particular broken collarbone in here <laughs> um, is where it likes to, I, I have a feel and I, ex I communicated that to uh, Simon, who did the extension for me, and he did exactly what I wanted. It's not in the best of health. It's been rejointed twice because I have thrashed it. Wow. I've had the rib relayed by Dixon's uh, up in Scotland, who very kindly did that for me, um, without complaining about the state of my gun, um, because it's an old gun. Things go wrong with old guns. But so it's... You've invested quite a lot more than your 325 to begin with. We've discussed previously you have to be happy with concessions. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, it's, it's like paying for a service for a, for a classic car. You're going to do it yeah. because you want it to keep going. 
It's not, oh, it's broken, chuck it. Not for me. Not that, well, it never has been for me. This is always the gun I go back to. It's too tight for game shooting, um, for most game shooting, uh, but it suits me for clays. It's a really cool gun. I'm very proud of you for your achievement with Thank it this you. year. Yeah, it's, it was good fun to do. It was pretty cool. It was, an, it was a, an interesting and a very odd experience getting to, I've never been in a shoot-off before. Driving back to the two, because it's a four-day competition, because there's 16, 13, 1,500 people that go through the competition. Driving back on the Sunday for the shoot-offs was an interesting mental battle with myself because there's always that temptation to go, oh, I missed that easy one on a stand eight, that last target. And I, I just switched off the concentration and dropped the straightforward target. And if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be in a shoot-off. I would have run it out right. But then you have to check yourself and not go down that mentality uh, you have to then say, well, it's a privilege to be in a shoot-off. No one else is in a shoot-off. You've earned your spot here. You now have to do what needs to be done. This is your chance now. Yeah. Um, and I was shooting you... off against a very nice chap called Francis Alexander, who's an outstanding side-by-side shot. Uh, and we had a little bit of um, friendly banter beforehand because he was shooting a Beretta Para 486. With a fantastic gun. Extended teak choke sticking out the end of it. And he said, I'm really sorry, but my gun's got sticky out chokes. And I said, well, I'm really sorry, but my gun's got sticky out hammers. So we'll probably be all right together, won't we? Um, and we were shooting the same shoot-off target that Phil Gray and P um, Phil Thorold and uh, James Adcock, they were all shooting as well. I, so It does seem a little unfair, but having seen you with that, there's no disadvantage. No, you, yeah. it's there. You've got to be killed. It's got to be killed. Yeah. So you just get on with it. A modern cartridge will do what modern cartridge does. Does it care what gun Absolutely. it's in? Right. Absolutely. I have to say, I do prefer shooting lighter loads through it. I tend not to shoot 28 gram loads. I'll shoot a 26 gram load. I was shooting a 26 gram load that day, and Stuart Smith, the owner of the ground, came up to me and went, You killed that first pair beautifully. What cartridges were you using? And I went, 26 gram eights. And he went, Really? <laughs> yeah, you don't need a big punchy load. It is funny. I remember we moved from 32s to 28s. The Olympic guys are on 24s. Exactly. And I often shoot a 24 through this because yeah. I love it. It's so soft, so smooth. And when you shoot 200 targets, you want a 24 gram load of good quality because that there is a recoil factor with a side by side. And what you, does it weigh? It weighs seven pound four. That's about a pound and a half to two pounds lighter than some of your other competition yes, guns out there. It is. You just adjust and aim off those factors. There's no drawback shooting a light load. No. There really isn't. Um, and actually, that was brought home to me by the guy who recommended the 24 gram load to me. He said, if it's good enough for me at Olympic Trap and the second barrel boy, it's good enough for you. <laughs> and he was right. It's a very good way of putting it. Yeah. This is it. I think there's a confidence boost to an ounce load occasionally. Occasionally. And there's certain targets that I do like to put bigger, faster shells in. Yeah. It make, I mean, I know it makes a difference, but I think a lot of it is up there, isn't it? It's, it is. It's all mental. Yeah. Um, you can get anybody to a 75%, 75 out of 100. Most people will get there. Yeah. The next 25% is all fought and won and lost in the small real estate that is the grey bits between your ears. Yes. That's it. I think that's a really cool little sealed bid success story. Most of the things I buy from the seal bid end up being shot twice and then I go and look <laughs> at them occasionally. It's nice to see something actually being taken out, used, loved, used so much it needed rejointing twice. That's... Yeah, that's but it's a shooting. big strong gun and it'll take it. It just, you occasionally you'll have to put a new cross pin in because it's the gun I shoot best with. And we left it out of the, the film we did previously with about my guns in the cabinet. This one did not appear because it was away being rejointed at the time. <laughs> So, yeah, but there you go. It's one of those things you can just have a lot of fun in the sealed bid, pick up something like that, go and shoot to a reasonable standard with it. Quite a good standard. Well, yeah, well, practice makes perfect. And the side-by-side -side thing is, it's a very interesting niche as a competition thing. I think that's cool as well. Yeah, I just wish there were more people who, who I, I wish there were more of the major competitions that have a side-by-side -side category. And very few of them do, sadly. And I think if the category was there, more people would turn up. I think the side-by-side -side deserves more of a place in, in modern clay shooting. As well as looking for high-end London guns for no money, it's always worth looking for decent commercial investments, a gun you could use and then sell, or a gun you could buy and refurb and sell, or even a gun that you've always wanted that perhaps you didn't have the budget for. Here is a case and point of something like that. It is all about making concessions, right, about things, and there's a definite concession with this. Lot 6408 is a 23-year-old Beretta double double L. We can all agree that the 680 platform that it's based on is fantastic. It is a 20 gauge. I've been looking at a lot of sub gauges this auction. I should call them small bores. Hey, look, the viewership split between England and America. I'm sorry, but we can all share the languages. I'm sure in that four ball video, I actually might have said, maybe I didn't, that 
Neither is correct. It should be called a 20 gauge bore. And that is what they used to call it. And then as more modern pants came along, America just kept the gauge and we just kept the bore. And I finally found a reason and an actual explanation of why we call them different things. And the fact that we're both wrong makes me feel good. Anyway, Beretta 687 double double L Diamond Pigeon, one of the most successful common sold side bladed guns in the world ever. This one is seven to 900 pounds. It's got the standard stock, so you can interchange the pads. It's 14 and a quarter currently. You can take that out to about 15 and a quarter with their pads without spaces. You have a 28 inch fixed choke barrel. That is choked quarter and improved cylinder in one of these. The side plates are beautiful and it's from a period of where the engraving was quite nice. And again, it's all personal preference, but they have changed over the years. The wood on it is fantastic, I think. It's very nice. I mean, the gun really has seen no use. You look at it and it's done almost nothing. And yet, somewhere along the course of its life, somebody decided to checker the stock. It is a straight hand stock, and the checkering is about the worst job I've ever seen. And that is a really complimentary word for it. There is many words you could use that would be worse. It's bad. It's really very, very bad. However, it's not so bad that the gun isn't worth seven to nine hundred pounds. If you're savvy with your money and you do search and you take the time and you understand that this is okay to shoot for now, you could quite happily wait for a spare stock to come on eBay, a spare stock to come up in Holtz, a spare stock to come up in your local gun shop, and you'll be paying three or four hundred pounds, maybe. You could get a WWL 20 ball fixed choke for 1500 pounds. It's interesting and important at this point, I point out that guns like this. The estimate is seven to 900, but it's a sealed bid sale. And for those of you who don't know how that works, you have to put a bid in before the auction starts. There is no auction day, there's no auctioneer. You put the bid in you're willing to pay. If you're the highest, you win. You pay commission on it. If someone else bids the same before you, they win. If someone bids the same after you, you win. It's quite a simple thing. It, it, it can be frustrating, but only when you don't take something seriously enough. You'll soon know that you actually should have bid more when you lose something and you go, I wish I'd bid more. And you'll soon know that no one else wanted it if you bid below the asking price or in that middle bracket and no one else bids. It's a really tough thing. Serious bids win, I say this every time. Serious bids win, casual bids don't. But yeah, what a lovely gun. I would love to meet who did that checkery. That is clearly ambition outweighing talent. But hey, this gun's still shootable. And you don't look, at, look, you cover it up when you shoot it, your friends will never know. At Holt Seal Bid, there are a lot of boxes. We used to play Boxer Roulette, we don't do that anymore because I always pull out the wrong stuff. <laughs> so I set Simon on a task to go through the boxes or at least find one in a case that I think is nice. Yeah, it's a usable, not very modern. It's 1904, uh, but it's by one of my favorite makers, which is William Rochester Pape. Pape was a prolific inventor based up in Newcastle upon Tyne, supplier of fishing rods, fishing tackle, gun maker. And he made some really interesting, really quirky guns, had his own style. In, okay. Some of his hammer guns were very, very stylish. I mean, he's a long way from London. He is, yeah. And he's he's catering to, uh, I think he built guns for the, the Dukes of Northumberland as well, because they were around there. Wow. Um, but all of the landed gentry up there, all of the, the businessmen who were out shooting, he, he built really good quality guns, and he has a following paper. This one I picked out because it's a very usable side by side. Nice pistol grip, which is what you know, mm. modern shooters like. It's got a three inch chamber and side clips. It's a not overly heavy English box lock, non-ejector, uh, probably a wild fowling style gun, not a live pigeon gun because it's not quite high enough quality for live pigeon shooting. Um, but it's my kind of box lock and you could crush clays quite happily with this. It's true cylinder in the right, half choke in the left. What more do you want? I'll do what you want. Two to 300 quid <sighs> with a case. It's... Unarguable bargain. I mean, that is my kind of thing. 300 pounds. Plus commission, obviously. No. We've got to mention that. We always yeah. do. But it's just a... a it's 30% on 300 pounds. Like, yeah. if we were talking about a 10 grand gun, 30% is a huge dent in your pocket. Yes. But 300 plus commissions, 400, best part of. Yeah. 400 pounds. Nice wide rib, not far cut, plain rib, mm. with the maker's name written on it. You can save yourself quite a bit of money by shopping for non-ejectors. I mean, look at the way that finial is inlet. That's gorgeous. It's a very high quality gun. That's beautiful. I mean, that is 
a lot of work to get that. Is it that good? Is it bad that it makes me sad that's only £300? It is a little bit of a travesty, in my opinion. Um, but there we are. Uh, look, you can look at it two ways. Either we are criminally undervaluing this, or that's a complete bargain. It's definitely a bargain. I'll go with bargain. We were just packing up to leave, saying goodbye to the guys, and I got shown this. This is going in the next main sale, and I thought I'd share it with you. The teak boxes that come with it give away the game that say Purdy Sport to 20 gauge lead and steel. It comes in a beautiful leather case and is always a treat to sort of get the advanced viewing on these. This is coming into the next auction at 15 to 20 grand, which is a lot of money by comparison to some of the guns we've seen today. But when you open it up, it is really very beautiful. It is a Purdy Sporter, 30 inch 20 bore Sporter. It's really very nice. We did a video on the new version. This is one of the ones that was, oh, it's half Italian, half English. I, I remember people at the time saying, it's, uh, it's not truly London. I'll tell you what, I don't have no issues with this gun whatsoever. It is a beautiful, modern looking gun. And if it's half Italian, I mean, they, they are makers of some of the best over and unders in the world. So it's not, it's not really an insult, is it? Obviously, I like it because you can pull the trigger unit out. The gun's proof marks say it was London proofed in 2011. I love the engraving, I love the scroll back. I think that engraving pattern is really beautiful, but this little bordering on the trigger unit or, or to the where the detachable trigger comes out and this little crossed etching with the straight line shading. This is a lovely gun. Guys, thank you very much for watching. I look forward to being back here in November and checking out what they've got other than this little sweet purdy. We'll see you soon. Good luck in the sealed bid. I've put my bids in. I uh, look forward to hearing what you guys have bought as always. Thank you for watching guys. This channel is made possible by our amazing sponsors. You can find out more about them in the description down below. And if you want to support the channel, you can join as a member. You get loads of extra content. Well, some extra content. And occasionally we hook up and go clay shooting together as a membership group. If you don't feel like joining today, we really appreciate you watching and subscribing. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>